Welcome to Caregiver Cast with Mary Elaine Petrucci. Are you overwhelmed raising a family, working full time, caring for a parent or grandparent? It can be challenging when you're doing it alone. Caregiver Cast helps busy, burned out professionals reduce their stress and overwhelm to create a better caregiving experience for themselves and their loved ones. Caregiver Cast brings caregivers together with experts who provide information in a variety of areas. In each episode, you'll get tips on topics such as finance, legal, medical, self care, community resources, mindset, and more. We're here to make your caregiving journey a more rewarding one. Acquire the confidence and skills to be a more capable caregiver by implementing the resources and strategies from these expert thought leaders. Get a community of support, resources, and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the Caregiver Lifeline community. Visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com. And now here's your host, Mary Elaine Petrucci. Hi, I'm Mary Elaine Petrucci, your host to Caregiver Cast. And my guest today is Linda McDougall, who will be talking to us about blind eye care that she sees in different settings as a massage therapist. Before I formally introduce Linda, I will give you some information about her. She is a licensed massage therapist for over 16 years. She's worked with hundreds of seniors and sees daily the physical and postural damage inflicted by mobility devices that are incorrectly fitted or used. She is a holistic health practitioner and a specialized massage therapist for seniors and the disabled. Linda McDougall has been a direct care worker, a mental health care worker, and administrator of two group homes for the United Cerebral Palsy and a federal advocate for the developmentally disabled population of the state of Hawaii and more. Linda holds a master's in counseling psychology. Seeing the undressed, unaddressed needs in senior care led Linda to write her book, The Spirit Method of Massage for Seniors, Raising the Bar, a Primer for the Massage Therapists and Caregivers. As a boomer herself, Linda has a unique and empathetic vantage point. Through her book and media interviews, she is raising her voice for the real care in our senior years. Welcome, Linda, to Caregiver Cast. How are you? Thank you, Mary. I'm fine. So let me ask you, what is your definition of blind-eyed care in senior living situations? Oh, wow. Um... Just things that I see and know that other people don't. And I'm I'm assuming, and I know this is true anyway, whether I assume it or not, that other professions who know things other than what I know see the same types of problems from their vantage point. Uh, One of the things that I think is severely neglected is the fact that all of us come into senior care homes And we come and go like ghosts, most of us. Mm, That is true. Mm -hmm. I come, do my job, I go. Nobody asks me, well, is there anything we can do for Mary? (laughs) Is there anything that would help you and your work with Mary? Nobody talks about anything. You Mm. just come, you weren't there ever in the first place. So it's, it's for me, and I imagine for other ther- types of therapists, it's a game of Groundhog Day. Okay. You continue to have to do the same things because nobody's working with the client in between time. And I, I would agree with you, Linda, as a speech language pathologist. Um, I hear what you're saying because caregivers in those types of situations really don't have the time to work with the client um, in in between like our therapy sessions or massage therapy sessions because they're really stressed and overwhelmed. 
However, that isn't an excuse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and not to um, call it to someone's in attention. So is there a way, um, can you give us, well, first, give us some examples that you've seen, and I know you've given me a great example <laughs> from a, an older woman who was trying to get on a bed. Can you share that expense, uh, experience with us, please? One of the things I have seen repeatedly is bad choices of furniture for the seniors that have them. Okay. And this I have several examples of that. But the one you're referring to was, I was doing a talk on my, my standard talk, the vices of mobility devices uh, for a home local locally. And as I was winding up and answering a few questions from the seniors who surrounded me at the end, uh, a little lady came up and she goes, would you come with me when you're done to my room? Mm -hmm. I want to do something. And I said, sure. Now, mind you, she, she lives with all these professionals. She had never told them. So one of the things you have to think about is what do your therapists and other people know that you don't? <laughs> because okay. the people are coming to us rather mm -hmm. than you necessarily. And that surprised me, number one. Okay. And I got up and here's this diminutive lady. And she shows me how she gets into her pedestal bed. Now, this pedestal bed was almost as high as she was. <laughs> and so she's on her tiptoes, bent over, trying to get her buttocks purchased on the bed, just so she can begin the process of getting into bed. Oh, my I God. I thought tip over and, you know, land on her head. Then she somehow manages to get a little tiny bit of purchase. And she throws herself over onto the bed. Mm. Now that that threw, threw me too. Who knew she could do that? <laughs> but I guess she'd had some practice. <laughs> Obviously. Oh my gosh. And to, to top it all off, she got on the bed, but then she had to claw her way to the center of the bed, pulling herself so she wouldn't fall off the edge of the bed. Now, why anybody setting up that person's living quarters didn't see that, number one. Why care staff didn't see that, number two. Why any administrative staff, staff who go in and out every once in a while didn't see it and didn't recognize it. Lord knows, I don't know. I was stunned. And I told her- I can her understand. Life, I would go downstairs and I would tell somebody and I did. And I don't know if it was ever corrected or not because I don't go to that facility that often. But that just threw me because I know it's a good facility overall. Mm -hmm. Airing facility, but they did not even notice that. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that that sounds... <laughs> like an incredible way to get into bed number one or get out of bed and number two i'm so glad that you said something to administration before you left because that obviously even as a speech language pathologist i could see that as being totally unsafe of course i mean she could have easily I mean, a lot of seniors, many, many, many seniors have osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. It's a diminutive little white lady and diminutive little ladies of almost any origin mm -hmm. have osteoporosis. And she, obviously her feet did not touch the floor if she were getting out of bed. So she would have had to have either eased herself off the bed or taken a small jump uh, the whole thing was crazy. Um, so I had to talk to the administration because 
that's basically, I think, what she brought me in for. And so I did that. Uh, being an advocate, that's what you do. <laughs> Thank you for advocating for this woman because it sounded um, like a horrific situation. Like you said, she could have broken um, her pelvis or her hip. She could have had a head injury. Um, there's or a combination of all of those. Um, that is pretty frightening. And I've got a couple of other of the same variety. Mm -hmm. I had a very tall, opposite of the little diminutive woman. I had a very tall, six foot something Parkinson's client, and he was for some strange reason in a little tiny <laughs> in a little tiny uh, chair, and so he had these long legs and so the knees were up almost in his face and then to make it even worse this guy read a lot okay mm -hmm. to make it worse the table beside the chair was as small as the chair it was oh a my gosh and then it had a little it was one of those old ones with the lamps attached so it had the lamp curve curving over so he not only had to bend over but he had to get his book underneath the lamp so he was feet up I mean knees up and over twisted spine twisted shoulders twisted neck just to read oh my gosh and I brought that up to both his daughters one of whom was a nurse I never heard anything about it after that and nothing ever changed until he died in early 2020. Mm. Uh, but I also brought it up to the caregiver who I knew personally. And I told her, if you're not gonna get him a new chair, then at least get risers for the chair so his knees won't be in his chest, you know, while it... Right. And she tried one, one kind of riser and it didn't work. And so it was just kind of ditched. So until his death, he had this, little tiny table, little tiny lamp, and little tiny chair for this huge man. That was sad and un unavoidable. I mean, this everything I talk about is usually avoidable. People were looking and paying attention. Well, it's interesting to me that that A occurred and somewhat surprising was this man able to communicate yes but stutter stutteringly like his walk but yes he could communicate but he never seemed to, he, I don't think he, <laughs> i'm sorry say that again i don't know if he knew it was bad well and i'm he, also <laughs> kind of surprised that he didn't say it advocate for himself um he didn't Wow. But being a massage therapist, I see when the body's all squenched what it does. And I, mm -hmm. of course, working on him and I had to try to correct that once a week too. <laughs> and again, you can't do what you need to do if, if the items around the person that support the person aren't correct. Just like with the walkers and the wheelchairs and the canes and everything else I talk about. So... <laughs> That's just, I okay. see so much. Well, I I understand what you're saying. I am, they had a, a person that had, I think, a severe head injury. And I think they lowered his bed and I think they had a mat on the floor. And they wanted me to do some cognitive therapy with him and I needed to work with like an occupational therapist or a physical therapist to help me get him to stand and to do an exercise um, but I needed their support and I found it a challenge to get the support that I needed 
from another discipline in order to serve best serve that client. And of course, as you know, bed rails and things are <clears throat> considered inappropriate. They're they're called a restraint. So they have to put the patient down low enough so that if they do fall out of bed, at least they're falling on a mat. However, I, I mean, those are the types of situations that are really a challenge to, um, to advocate for because, A, you're not getting the support from another professional. However, you, there's, Anything that you could possibly recommend would be considered a restraint. I totally so, understand. <laughs> so I know that you're in a similar situation. I know that there was someone like kind of in a, it wasn't exactly a jerry chair. Um, just so that the person could be more, I guess, mobile Again, it's a challenge sometimes to support those people when they have like these um, restraints themselves. So can you maybe address that, um, what you've seen in that regard um, and how you've been able to have be effective in making that change? Well, so far, the kinds of change you're talking about, at least, the, the problem with the overall overarching problem of calling things restraints when they are supports irritates me badly because I was, I was alive and kicking when they made the change between supports and restraints. And then suddenly you can't get a support for people anymore who are seniors. You realize that the developmentally disabled clients have gear from head to toe. Mm. You can't do that for seniors most of the time because they consider even a seat belt to keep people from sliding out of their wheelchairs a restraint. And to me, that is so ludicrous. These people fall, again, they have osteoporosis quite often because they're wheelchair bound in most cases. And if they slide out onto the floor, they can crack a hip mm -hmm. or work. This whole issue of restraint versus support just is, is at the heart of my problem with wheelchairs. Because if you notice with seniors, again, more than any other population that I'm aware of, when you, they go to get a wheelchair, mm -hmm. they're always, oh, always is a bad word, almost always given a transport chair, one that's meant to be in for maybe an hour or two when you go out shopping. Okay. They're not given a real wheelchair that can support supports for the head for the feet for the body for the torso they're not given anything so they get these pillows shoved under them and the pillows are squishy so they don't get mm. real support. Okay. and this is my vices of mobility devices things that i get just absolutely livid about because these people need support we are allowing them to deteriorate because we don't support the spine we don't support the muscles we don't support anything i have seen heads like this mm -hmm. we didn't support the head or heads that actually sat on the chest mm -hmm. because we support i've seen bodies twisted and tormented it's it's stupid if the doctor prescribes a wheelchair people need to be talking to medicare mm -hmm. and finding out what kind of real wheelchair will you support us getting with the doctor's prescription? And he will, he or she will need these supports. And they need to find out from Medicare up front 
what mm -hmm. they will, because they will only purchase certain ones anyway. That's correct. I, I hear that. Um, keep going. Well, they just need to be really proactive if they want anything more. I, I've had a connection on LinkedIn who is a disabled vet and he can't get anything more than a transport chair that he sits in all day. It is not good for his buttocks. It isn't good for anything. It doesn't support. I've had a recent client, same thing. She said she she got what she, the best she could get for her husband, but he's mm. got Parkinson's. He needs body supports. He needs things and she can't get them. And I, I've seen this over and over and over again. And it mm -hmm. just, it, it's wrong, <laughs> dead wrong. We are killing our seniors before they have to be killed just simply from squashing the organs and just mm -hmm. not the body in the manner it best works in. Well, I have seen people in wheelchairs with like a, a head strap to um and i th think they had maybe some shoulder restraints or to position them in the in the chair um that's more than i've seen <laughs> well i'm i'm thinking that that may have changed with like the changes with support versus restraint that that's my only concern. I, I, I totally hear you um, just working in nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities. Um, yeah, I've seen people just like you said, with their head down um, or squished in or contorted in ways, like you said, that the body shouldn't be in um, and nobody doing anything to make it better. And I, I would agree with you that things have to change. They have to. And that's why I go on these kind, kinds of podcasts, because there's too many things in senior care that need to change. And you need to be aware. That's what my book is all about, being aware of what is around you. What do you see? What works? What doesn't work for the person? The person may not say anything like my Parkinson's tall client. Right. Right. But you need to be able to see how he's contorted himself just to read a book or a magazine. And he shouldn't have to do like that to read. And no, it's so simple to mm -hmm. me. And anyway. I go in and I look at things and I go, why is that like that? And I, I know that staff are rushed in many times. I have had some help from staff though, I have to say. Uh, they have, with, with clients that I teach how to walk in walkers, mm -hmm. sometimes I see the staff that have listened to me work with that client as they're taking them from the dining room to their, their room or something like that, working with them in the same way, kind of saying, no, you need mm -hmm. to see be closer to the walker you need to walk inside the walker more than outside you don't need your butt hanging out in the wind because <laughs> mm -hmm. you see them misusing those walkers all over the place and if you really can't use a walker correctly then you may need a scooter or a wheelchair or you need an upright walk those upright walkers are kind of cool if if you know what they are because they keep you upright and you're either you're Yep. Either your forearm or your whole arm is right. held mm -hmm. so that you're grasping things here and it holds your whole body up. <sighs> we, we, we are letting ourselves get old before we need to get old by not fixing these things. Because people get crippled by misusing all these devices. And they're all being misused. I see it. I live in a senior community out in the community. Mm. And I see it here all the time. In fact, on the 5th of January, I'll be giving a talk. I'm beginning to be like a Tupperware lady. 
They're bringing me in for talks <laughs> in homes to help get ed get them educated before they have to get walkers or or maybe they're taking care of somebody with a walker or a cane or a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So I'm beginning to do those kind of things. I can do them on Zoom, I imagine, as well, if anybody out there is interested. But we really need to get this known and fixed. Mm -hmm. It take advocacy from all of us, mm -hmm. especially the seniors if they're able and their and their kids. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're totally correct. Um, I have seen things like you have described, and I think there needs to be a mechanism um, in place. The only, um, I'm thinking now um, that you could do one of, you can call the ombudsman. I, I, I don't know how effective that would be. The other would be to um, contact like the Department of Public Health that um, goes out and investigates and um, what's the word, um, gives accreditation to the skilled nursing facility. That's the community care out here. I don't know what it is wherever you are, but it's community care licensing out here. Oh, okay. Um, and the other is just to advocate with um, Medicare and Medicaid, the CMS office. Um, and if you can, I think it would bolster the argument um, by if you could get permission from the family to take photos. photos. Of the client themselves in those situations. Yeah, and I'd have to get enough people that would, would re be really interested in advocating because we can take it to our own uh, government people in our local areas too. Mm -hmm. and. I don't know. I just see it consistent. I've seen it consistently for decades now. And it's, mm. it's insane. I used to work at Camarillo State Hospital when I was much younger. And we did much better back then. We had some of the most crippled bodies you can imagine. Mm. It would go into this special little building we had at the state hospital, which is a university now. <laughs> But at the time, it was a little magic building that these very crippled individuals would go into. And in that magic little building, they would mold a specific whole body support for that individual and their best position without harming them, but their best position. Wow. Yeah. I think we can find that now. We can't even find a seatbelt now. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah. Young adults had wonderful support for those very crippled bodies. It sounds and like they had really the best care in that magic little building that you call it. I do call it a magic little building because it did wonders for those people who went in and came back out supported in the best way they could be for their deformity. Wow. And we don't do that for our seniors. Mm. <laughs> I just don't get it. And I did a, another podcast with Steve Gurney over on the East Coast uh, some time ago, it's on my website. And here I'm talking to this man who hadn't even ever thought about this particular issue. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the podcast, if anybody wants to listen, it's there. <laughs> he, go, he goes, and I work with the, I'm, I'm trying, Paralympics. 
And he had not thought that all the supports the Paralympics get, the seniors didn't. He hadn't made that transition. Oh. And he goes, well, they've got everything. I said, yes, they do. And what do our seniors have? Zero. <laughs> or next to zero. Wow. I, I would wonder if he did anything after he you helped him make that connection between the two, well, between the Paralympics so. and the seniors. I think his eyes are now open. Now what he can do on his, that during the pandemic, I did a lot of podcasts and I just found out it was coast to coast. It wasn't just here in California. And I thought maybe it was just here and we were just being backwards for some reason when we used to be forward. <laughs> So it's, it was here in California where that little magic building was too many decades ago. So that was in the 70s, I think. Well, um, I was in a chronic care hospital and I don't remember that kind of service being offered to like the clients or the patients that were there for a long time. Um, let me share another story. Um, <clears throat> there was a Jerry psychiatric unit in this chronic care hospital. And one of the mental health professionals would refer patients to me as a speech pathologist. And there was a woman who um, definitely had a, a voice disorder and I'm sure it was due to like all the medications that she had been on for many, many, many decades. And um, they had her restrained with like one of those bibs at the time back in the eighties. And I heard that she had slipped under it and choked. Oh. Yeah, um, that really was very upsetting to me. Because I, I mean that the support, <laughs> let's use that word, support, wasn't giving her the support that she needed because she was slipping through because um, it wasn't attached uh, properly, I'm I'm assuming. Yeah, that would be my assumption too. And uh, not so much for support. i recalling another situation I was working in a um, skilled or an assisted living facility that had a rehab unit. And they just brought in this gentleman. Um, and the next day, I guess I went in and there was this big uproar in going on and um, with the nursing um, department. And apparently, apparently, um, the CNA put the patient in the wheelchair, had his oxygen tank attached, I guess, to the wheelchair. She never turned it on. The patient expired. And I'm like, oh my, this is happening like in the you know, 2000s, you know, 2012 or something. I, I can't remember the year, but it, I mean, it's, it's fright. It was frightening to think that things like that are overlooked because people are so stressed and overwhelmed because they have a huge caseload of clients to watch for and there's not enough staff. I've had an odd thought on not enough staff, but 
and so far nobody has heard me, but I think that there are a lot of homeless people who are not homeless because of drugs or anything, but here in California, they're, they're losing their homes because they can't afford them anymore. Right. Uh, so you've got a lot of people that could be interested in training to become so that they would have some sustenance for their family as well as helping. That's correct. In addition to the training, though, they need to incorporate what you and I have seen so that they can prevent it from happening again. Well, this is another thing. I keep thinking they need somebody like me or you in every home to be an advocate, to go mm -hmm. around and see what isn't being done for so-and-so, what so-and-so needs it or wants that isn't being uh, listened to or whatever. They mm -hmm. need it kid in every home it's not going to prevent every problem that there is but it's going to help address a lot of problems that aren't being looked at now correct and i think even though that they're receiving here in colorado at least um they have um the department of public health that goes in every year or whatever um, depending on whether or not they have um, violations that they need to correct. Um, there has to be a way to train that staff to as to what to look for and then what to advocate for um, as well. Yeah, I think fun. there's a lot of moving parts yeah to but it's funny say that because before the pandemic i was in talks with the ombudsman office on a irregular basis but there was somebody there that was interested in having me come and teach them about the devices and things and what what to look for mm -hmm. since i've since the pandemic i have reached out again and i they won't even talk to me now <laughs> so wow so what can I say? It, there was a huge change in in my area, at least in in personnel everywhere. Everybody I had networked with for years pretty much disappeared. They either retired or they changed jobs and who knows where they went, you know. And so I've had to start all over again at my age to <laughs> to network and get back into places I had it into at the time, but don't have it anymore. Well, I'm in a similar situation with caregivers because you, I've, I've heard recently that um, there was a Family Caregiver Act that was implemented. I don't know the specifics. However, I, th I can only imagine that it would be only touching the top of the iceberg. It's not really addressing many of the issues for family caregivers uh, and not helping them. Well, it see it it depends if the means, I guess, of the family caregiver. So if it's like um, a son or daughter that takes care of someone, um, without holding an, another outside job, then that's different than if you're thinking of someone in the sandwich generation who's raising a family, still working full-time and caring for a parent, a grandparent. I think caregivers, especially family caregivers and home caregivers, um, haven't really been helped I think during this whole crisis and I know it was hard with COVID because nurses and doctors were stressed to the limit and a lot of people now are leaving the profession which is really sad um, and we're going to have a crisis in eight years when 
another 75 million baby boomers will be retiring. And that will be 45% of our workforce. And there will be no one caring for the um, older seniors, older baby boomers. It's going to be quite the um, challenge and nightmare to attempt to avert, like now. Um, like you said, I mean, they're not, the seniors' needs aren't being addressed in these various um, living situations. And now with COVID and the fact that many caregivers are now extended even more because um, so many people have, so many caregivers have left. I, something needs to be done like now. So I understand what you're saying. It's, no one should be treated like that and they should have the support and the services that they need. They need to have a quality of life like in, anyone else. And it's those that are gonna be coming into the system that probably have the louder voice that need to be, it's one reason at 74, I'm talking about it because I'm just going, you know, guys, I'm planning really hard not to ever go to one of those places. Mm -hmm. One never knows. Just right. like my accident yesterday, one never knows. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to go. I have, I'm setting up my home and my life so that I can be here little by little. But, you know, I don't, want to be in one of those places because of all the things that are overlooked. I want change way before I have to be there. And that would mean now. <laughs> and okay, Linda, I think we're, we're speaking the same language. So I guess we're going to have to advocate. I try yeah. to do my best. That's why I come on your podcasts and others, because I'm trying to get the word out there that we need to raise voices all over the nation because the whole nation apparently from my podcast doesn't see the issue they just don't see it they're blind to them because they've seen the seniors like that forever i saw a little tiny man itty bitty i couldn't believe it and somebody had put him for an event outdoors mm -hmm. they had been this wheelchair that was meant for somebody that must have been three or four hundred pounds it was huge mm -hmm. And the man took up like a corner of the wheelchair and he was totally bent over, totally. And there was no support, not even a pillow. Oh. And I, I had to bring somebody's attention to him. And even right. then she acted like it was quite normal and didn't do a thing about it. And I was stunned and that was years ago, but I saw it and I just went, nobody's looking at this poor man. He could curl up and go to sleep in that wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it. It was so big. He literally could. He was tiny. And it was just so ridiculous. Earlier, you had talked about the medications, too. That's another one of my. Yes. Let's my... go on that little um, trip down that lane. Go right ahead. Uh, yes. Um most seniors are on many, many medications. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Tell you about the nutrient depletions that happen with those medications. An aspirin takes out five nutrients, just an aspirin. So if you consider over-the-counter as well as prescribed, what they can take out is humongous. And if we aren't aware of it and we aren't replenishing for that senior and nobody does that I'm aware of too often, then that's another reason we go downhill. And that uh, too is reversible. Okay. So um, you've, now I won't look at another aspirin or ibuprofen ever again um, because I, wouldn't know what to replace so i oh my gosh it's amazing that like dietitians don't know that information either and that's one of my issues with 
the menus in these homes because I've gone into dementia wards that hadn't been filled yet. It was a brand new facility and they were so proud of it and they show me. And in, inside the dementia ward is this whole case of sweets. And I'm going, do you not understand the link <laughs> between sweets and the third diabetic thing, which is Alzheimer's? It's the third dementia. And you're feeding them stuff that's going to inflame the body more. And I brought that up and they just said, oh yeah, but it's okay. Yeah. And you can't, you're not getting through. I'm not getting through. That dementia, you need to lower sugar levels. You need to lower some salt levels because often there's some high blood pressure going on too. You need to do a whole revamping of the diet and you can still make it a good diet if you got a, a proper, what, what's the word? I can't even remember the word now. Anyway, it's a specialized nutritionist that deals with natural replacements. But I've, I've talked to places about that. And of course, they don't want to do that because then they'd have to get rid of some of these big companies that come supply them with food. Right. Yes, I hear that. So there's a few um, physicians that I've heard about, um, like Dr. Siraji and Sarazi. They're both neurologists, but they're doing a lot of work with diet at Loma Linda. Um, there's Dr. Breedson. There's, I think, Dr. Pol Perlmutter, who... I think they're all doing things with diet and they're finding um, a connection between the two. Yeah. So well, I, I, I think that right. dietitian schools and everybody else need to really um, start reading the research and implementing it. There's plenty of resources out there. There's a lot of physicians that are, are doing. I've the, been wanting to make posters mm -hmm. to go in senior living home dining rooms that say things something like if you're diabetic here are some things you need to be eating and things you don't need to be eating if you're this if you have parkinson's this may be something you want to consider in this so that they know when they go in there what what they should choose and shouldn't now it's up to them what they choose and if they right. want to eat the same old stuff, but that's just it. We're feeding them the same old stuff that got them sick in the first place. And we're not changing it up. I go into some of these homes and they have all these sweets, lots of carbs, all the things that you'd really need to start carving out or changing. I mean, there's, there's xylitol. I've used xylitol in my tea and my coffee for eons mm -hmm. because it builds bone and teeth rather than decays them. And it doesn't give me sugar. It gives me something that replaces stuff instead of takes away. Um, there's just so many things that could be done and it, None of them are being done. Now, I, I, I take that back. One, one home mm -hmm. company, there are two of those homes in the county here, serve organic food. And when I found them, I almost fell over and did a bows. You know? Wow. <laughs> because I was so stunned. And they feed it to their staff as well as their clients. And the staff, you know, go home and eat crud too, probably. Mm -hmm. But it's, but the seniors themselves are having so much depleted by these medications. You're right. They, they are. And we don't know. Well, I think we need to educate like the physicians, the pharmacists, the dietitians, and whoever else 
work and you know works with these seniors so that they could get you know continue the medication if necessary or at least counteract it with like the diet change i i totally agree with that oh i just started taking chin and salt and i'm not diabetic but chin and salt acts very much like metformin mm. metformin now metformin has some good and some bad metformin mm -hmm is one of the things that longevity experts advocate for. However, it also has some good or not so good side effects. Mm -hmm. Tenon salt does as well, if not better than metformin and doesn't have those side effects. <laughs> mm. So I just started taking that because I've always had high cholesterol. I'm not so worried about high cholesterol as my doctors are because I know cholesterol is what makes the brain. Mm -hmm. I know it's what makes the hormones in the body that we lose as we age. Mm -hmm. So I'm not as worried about it as they are. Plus I take uh, systemic enzymes, which keep the blood thin enough to flow and it eats out the scar tissue that makes the web that catches the stuff that blocks the arteries and things. Mm -hmm. So I've taken that for almost 20 years now. Um, so I'm not that worried about that, but so other people might be and might should be because maybe they've let a lot of stuff grow in their veins. But mm. Well, we have covered a lot today, Linda. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, can you give us some takeaways, three takeaways that caregivers need to really be aware of in terms of mobility, medications, other things that we discussed? Okay. Um, I'm not being paid to promote this online source. And at some point I may stop giving it out. <laughs> and right now I'll give it out. PharmacySolutionsOnline.com has a place where you can put in your, the drug you're taking and it will give you what it's taking out and what it's causing. Mm. Beautiful okay. resource. Okay, can you repeat that um, again, please? PharmacySolutionsOnline.com. Okay. PharmacySolutionsOnline.com. Okay, great. Beautiful source. Most people, most of these sites keep it hidden to only people who subscribe or only people who do this or that. This right. one I found is right out in the open. Okay, that's that's good to know. Okay, um, pharmacy solutionsonline.com. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. As far as walkers and canes go, you want the person to take a deep breath roll their shoulders back, stand as tall, comfortably as they can. And then the top of the cane or the walker needs to come just to their wrist. You shouldn't have to grasp a walker hard. You could have your hands just on the walker and as long as you walk straight, it will glide right along in front of you. Okay. But if you this, and I've seen this over and over again, I call it the grocery store, <laughs> grocery cart walk. That is so bad. Okay. Anyway, um, so there's that. What else? Um, diet. You just start limiting your sugar. Start, again, I'm not so worried about cholesterol, but somebody may have a reason to be, so don't just, don't just listen to me about not... <laughs> Not paying attention to that, but I don't. <clears throat> um, between the medications and what they take out and re replacing those, changing the diet so you have less sugar and less unrefined or less refined carbohydrates, um, you know, more whole grains, in other words, um, mm -hmm. and replacing what 
what these things are taking out. And oh, another good one. Seniors do not digest as well as they used to. They don't make the acid they used to. They don't have the enzymes they used to. All those things that help us absorb. So even though we get whatever we're being fed, we're not mm -hmm. getting as out of it as we used to. Another reason for organic, by the way. Okay. But we, so diets should contain liquid or spray or something that's really easily absorbed like powders even and not hard pills if you can avoid them because mm. okay. we don't break down hard pills well anymore okay. we didn't probably when we were younger a lot of hard pills used to go right out the other end <laughs> but you want something that's going to go i have sprays that i use so it goes in the mucosal lining and the mouth doesn't even go to the stomach i have liquids and I have capsules with powders. Very few solid pills at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And I hear that you have a free offer for our listeners today. Um, I am perfectly happy to do a 15 minute consultation if anybody's interested in talking to me further. Uh, my email is arthritiscoach.com, arthritiscoach at gmail.com, sorry. Or you can go to my website, loveyourlongevity.com, and you can reach me through that as well. And you can see other things that I do, including the book. The book is there. Um, I just put a course online as well, and that's on the mobility devices it's on sale for another day or two. And then after that, it's going to be going up a hundred dollars. So, okay. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on today, Linda. I really have a, appreciate all the information that you and I have discussed. You've definitely opened my eyes to um, how I need to advocate more. So thank you for that. And um, Thank you very much for sharing all that information. And um, I hope the listeners take advantage of that 15 minute consultation with you so that they can um, become much more aware of things that they need to change for the senior. So thank you so much. All about awareness. It really is just like that lady with the oxygen tank. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Many more stories like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver Cast today. Get a community of support, resources, and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the Caregiver Lifeline community. Visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com. Get involved with the show. Send your email to mpetrusi2002 at gmail.com. And we'll see you again next week for another episode of Caregiver Cast.